Hello, everyone, and welcome to the sixth annual Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. My name is Erica Hazel, and I'm here this year as the Vallejo Community Organizer. We have an amazing program in store for you today, and we are so excited to have you here on Zoom for the second year in a row, because your health and safety matters to us. This year, we have kept our event online due to the COVID-19 pandemic that has affected so many of our communities. It is our sincerest hope that you and your family members are staying safe and healthy. For the sixth year of the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival, we have an amazing schedule filled with entertaining cooking demos, interviews, performances, and more, all celebrating the beauty and culture of Vallejo. The theme for the sixth year of the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival is a healthy Vallejo for today and tomorrow. Each weekend, we will take you on a journey and share with you the many simple ways that you can introduce healthy habits and changes in your life for your present and your future. But before we begin, we wanna acknowledge that September 15th to October 15th marks the celebration of Latinx Heritage Month. The next 30 days is all about the many cultures, contributions and resiliency of Latinx and Latinx identified communities around the world. Latinx Heritage Month is centered around the Independence Day celebrations of several nations in Central and Latin America, including Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, and Nicaragua in the early 1800s. Five of these proud nations declared their independence from Spain on September 15th, with Mexico's declaration the next day on September 16th. Today's festivities include an introduction to Food Empowerment Project, a tribute to Maria Guevara, two cooking demos, a reflection on being vegan for the animals, and a spectacular tour of Vallejo People's Garden and a toe tapping performance by Quetzale Bale Folklorico. We will end our time together with an update on access to healthy foods in Vallejo with Helen Marie Cookie Gordon. At the end of today's program, we will respond to all the questions that you have for us. As a reminder, you can send your questions throughout the event. Please use the Q&A chat box located at the bottom of your screen and we will respond to them during the Q&A session. And as a reminder, if you're one of the first 12 participants from Vallejo who joins us for today's festival, we will be giving you a free vegan cookbook gift box. If you haven't already done so, please fill out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. So now that we're getting started, I wanna introduce you to our organization behind this amazing festival. Food Empowerment Project, or FEP for short. FEP is a registered nonprofit 501c3 that promotes veganism, fights for farm workers, works on the lack of access to healthy foods in our communities of color, and encourages people to not buy chocolate sourced from some of the worst forms of child labor. The upcoming video will introduce you to our work and our hope for our planet and its inhabitants to better understand the connections between people, non-human animals and our environment. Now, please give a warm welcome to Food Empowerment Project. Food is power. Our food system is a huge interconnected web stretching across the globe. It links fields to factories, human animals to non-human animals, workers to corporations. When we choose what to have for dinner, we're not just choosing what to eat. We're also choosing whether or not to support the industries that put the food on our plates. That's a lot of responsibility, but it's a lot of power too. For those of us who are able to make informed, ethical food choices, we can make a real difference in the lives of humans, non-human animals, and the earth. At Food Empowerment Project, or FEP, we believe that our food choices can change the world, and we want to show you how. The most incredible thing our food choices can do is reduce the amount of suffering in the world. How? Well, each year, tens of billions of non-human animals are exploited in our food production systems. Each one of them is an individual who is aware of their own existence, feels pleasure and pain, and wants to be safe and free. They are confined, separated from their families, mutilated, and killed. Our food choices can reduce the amount of suffering of non-human animals when cutting out meat, dairy, and other animal products. 
FEP promotes ethical veganism, encouraging people not to contribute to the exploitation and suffering of animals, both human and non-human. Our website is full of information to help people understand the power of their food choices and learn how these choices can impact non-human animals from chickens and rabbits to fishes and other sea creatures. And it also includes some recipes and meal ideas. To support this further, Food Empowerment Project has created two vegan websites, one featuring delicious Mexican food in English and Spanish, and one with amazing Filipinx recipes in English and Tagalog to help people go and stay vegan. So ethical veganism is important, but not everybody can get the kind of food they need for a healthy plant-based diet. If we want people to eat more fruits and vegetables, we need to make sure that all people have access to fresh, affordable produce. In black and brown communities and in low-income neighborhoods, access to fresh fruit and vegetables is often limited or non-existent. It is vital that we acknowledge the ways that racism and economic disadvantage prevent marginalized communities from being able to access healthier food. When invited, FEP makes an assessment on the availability of healthy foods and begins to work with local communities, policymakers, and community organizations. We then convene focus groups to determine the barriers seen and experienced by the community to help create solutions that will benefit the health of individuals over corporations. But we can't stop there. We want to get fresh produce on more shelves and on more plates. And those fruits and vegetables have to come from somewhere. We want people to think about the ways their food choices can reduce the suffering of non-human animals in our food system. But what about the humans in that system? Farm workers are some of the most vulnerable and exploited workers in the United States. They often work long hours in extreme heat, are exposed to agricultural chemicals, and many experience homelessness due to their low wages or wage theft. Also, many are migrant or undocumented workers who are threatened with deportation if they speak up, which leaves them vulnerable to a variety of abuses. In addition, female farm workers experience sexual harassment on a regular basis. We advocate for improvements to farm worker rights at corporate, legislative, and regulatory levels. In 2018, we helped overturn a rule that had forced the families of farm workers to move at least 50 miles away from the migrant camps when picking season was over a regulation that negatively impacted their children's education. This victory meant that their children could now finish their school year without having to move. On a grassroots level, FEP organizes a school supply drive for the children of farm workers to help ensure these kids are offered all the opportunities that come with an education, something their parents have sacrificed so much for so that they might have opportunities previous generations may not have had. The fight for farm workers' rights doesn't end at the borders of the United States. We have a responsibility to the people who supply us with our food, even when they're on the other side of the world. Some of the worst human rights abuses in our food system happen in the supply chain for that confection we all love so much, chocolate. The chocolate industry gets much of its key ingredient, cacao, from areas where the worst forms of child labor and slavery are most prevalent. Children as young as seven work long hours using dangerous equipment and in some cases are not allowed to leave the farms they work on and are beaten and sometimes not seen again if they try to flee. They go through all this just to make candy for us to eat halfway around the world. By informing people where their chocolate comes from, we can create transparency to help people eat with their ethics. On our website, Food Empowerment Project has a list of chocolate companies to let consumers know which companies we do and do not recommend based on the country of origin for their cacao. And we even have a free downloadable app to make it easy for those who have a smartphone. 
be sure to look out for our mascot, Chavez, to see which chocolates we recommend. Our food choices are powerful. That means people are powerful. And that means you are powerful. Food Empowerment Project is about showing people just how much power their food choices hold. We want everybody to understand how much good their food choices can do, how much suffering we can stop. But we understand that making the world more just and equal is not a simple task. We can't just think about humans or just non-human animals or just the earth. We have to understand the way that these things are interconnected and the complicated systems they create. Together, we can help each other understand the whole picture. Then, we can work toward a better world. Remember, food is power. Use it with compassion. Thank you for spending time to learn more about Food Empowerment Project and our work. We hope this helped you to better understand our organization and our connections to one another and to our planet. Next, we would like to honor the life and legacy of an important Vallejoan. Our hearts were shattered last year with the loss of Maria Guevara. Maria became Food Empowerment Project's community organizer in 2016, which truly set the stage for all of our work in Vallejo, including the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. She was instrumental in coordinating the seven focus groups we conducted in Vallejo on the lack of access to healthy foods, as well as our work, her work with professors and students at Turo University to help with the analysis of our focus groups. Maria's enthusiasm and love for her community and its people was infectious. She was always working to connect people who were passionate about making a difference, and many of whom we are honored to continue to work with today. She also introdu introduced us to the Ballet Folco Rico group and other incredible performers from the community. Maria founded Vallejo Together to help those in, com in the community experiencing homelessness and also made time to work on other projects in the community. She co-founded Unity Day as a way to help celebrate the diverse community that Vallejo is. Maria's work continues in the community, not only through Food Empowerment Project's work, but also through Vallejo Together. Now, please join me in honoring the life and legacy of Maria Guevara.
We hope that these words and images of Maria Guevara will help inspire you to create areas in your life where, as Maria would say, love explodes. Thank you so much for all that you have done, Maria. Like Maria's commitment to a better Vallejo, we'd like to remind you that Food Empowerment Project is looking for a full-time one-year term Vallejo community organizer to work closely with the community of Vallejo, California and FEP's team to help with a variety of programs and campaigns that align with our mission and support the community and organization's goals. Please click the link below to read more about it. Our next cooking presentation comes straight from our veganfilipinofood.com website, and we can't wait to show you how to make it. RG Enriquez is both a chef and a purveyor of both traditionally vegan and veganized Filipino food. RG was born and raised in Bacor, Cavite in the Philippines, where she grew up helping her mother cook traditional Filipino food for their family. At the age of 15, RG came to, with her family to San Francisco and she became a vegan in college. She is now the proud owner of the vegan food blog, Astig Vegan. And as our RG explains it, Astig in Tagalog, a Filipino dialect, is slang for tough, unique, or gutsy. And that is how she views vegan Filipino food, unique and gutsy. Now, please join me in welcoming RG Enriquez, who will be showing us how to make some delicious vegan Filipino spaghetti. Growing up in the Philippines, I would help my mom cook Filipino food. Later on, when I became vegan, I learned that Filipino food can still be vegan without losing its soul. I wanted to share this discovery with family, friends, and with you. Whenever there's a special occasion, my family and I celebrate it with festive Filipino food, including Filipino spaghetti. We enjoy Filipino spaghetti at birthdays, fiestas, and at Christmas Eve or Noche Buena. Unlike the Italian version, Filipino spaghetti is sweet and savory. Its main component is ground beef but I will show you a way to veganize it without having to compromise taste and texture. It's very possible and I will show you how. Here's what we'll need. For the meat of the sauce, 12 ounces of extra firm tofu. This one is hot soy. I froze it. So freeze it for at least four hours or overnight. Three vegan hot dogs, thinly sliced. I got both of them at my neighborhood grocery store, Rainbow Grocery in San Francisco. Four to five tablespoons of refined coconut oil. Refined means there's no coconut smell or flavor. Three to five tablespoons of cooking oil. I'm using here canola oil. For the sauce itself, five cloves of garlic, peeled, crushed, and minced. A cup of roughly chopped yellow onion. A cup of roughly chopped celery a cup of roughly chopped carrots, one half cup of roughly chopped red bell pepper, seeds removed, of course, a pinch of salt, a pinch of pepper, a few pinches of natural sugar. I say natural, or you can use evaporated cane sugar because white sugar, unfortunately, is not always vegan. The natural sugar is slightly brown, uh, and it's basically cane sugar without having to go through the refining process. A tablespoon of tomato paste, a tablespoon of sweet pickle relish, four tablespoons of maple syrup. If you're watching your glucose level or your sugar intake, you may use stevia. Three to four tablespoons of soy sauce, four tablespoons of non-dairy milk. I'm using here soy milk. Four cups of tomato sauce. And of course, for the pasta, a pound of spaghetti pasta. This is optional for the garnish, for the topping. One fourth cup grated vegan cheddar cheese. All right, so let's get cooking. But first, let me show you why I chose freezing the tofu. It will have that spongier, chewier texture that is very similar to ground beef. And let me cut this to pieces so I can show you cut this in half diagonally so I can show you here how much 
spongier it is. And then put them in the food processor, crumble it that way. Now the tofu is all crumbled up. It looks like this pan is hot enough, so we're gonna go ahead and get to frying. Refined coconut oil in there. Fry the tofu. To successfully fry tofu, make sure the oil is very hot and do not overcrowd the pan. So as you could see, you have that nice golden hue there. Okay, so we got the tofu out here and now it's time to fry the other meat of the spaghetti, which is the hot dog. We have the, um, the heat under low setting so they're not gonna burn. Now we'll add the hot dogs here. Depending on the brand of the hot dog, you may wanna add salt. Filipino spaghetti calls for Filipino hot dogs and Filipino hot dogs are usually red in color and they're sweet. They're a little sweeter than the American version. But seems like because the vegan hot dogs are the American version, the American flavor, I'm gonna add just a few pinches of natural sugar around to have that same taste that Filipinos love so much about Filipino hot dogs. This one is vegan. Okay, looks like they're done. Turn off the heat and we'll transfer it alongside fried tofu. This is my mom's version and the base for her sauce are all these kinds of vegetables that are beautiful and colorful. The carrots, celery, onions, and bell pepper. And the traditional cut is finely minced. Now, it will dramatically save us time if we use a food processor. So what I did here, just roughly chop them and then combine them in food processor. And you can, if you only have a small, small food processor, just do it in batches. And that's what we're gonna do. This is the texture that we're going for. So you could see it's finely, finely minced. So far so good, we'll heat the pan here to medium heat. Start with the garlic for about a good 20 seconds there. Add the minced vegetables. Add the sweet pickle relish. Add a little bit of salt and pepper. About three pinches. And a big pinch of pepper, about two. Pour the maple syrup, pour the soy sauce, pour the tomato sauce, add tomato paste, pour non-dairy milk, add the meat of the sauce, fried tofu and fried hot dogs. About 5 minutes. And I have been checking it every minute just to make sure that nothing sticks on the bottom of the pan and mixing it. And it looks like it's all done. Now it's time to taste my favorite part. Let's just add a little bit here. Mmm. The sweetness and the, and the savoriness of it, of the sauce, and of course the texture of the fried tofu is there. There's some chewiness and resistance that is great as a replacement for ground beef. And now it's time to cook the other part of the dish, the pasta. After all, it won't be Filipino spaghetti without the spaghetti. Right here. And we have a pot of hot water. 
turn back the heat on so just we can boil the water. This is an oh, add salt to season the water. And once it's boiling, I'm gonna add the pasta now. This takes about 10 minutes of just stirring gently. So I drain the pasta. Once it's cooked, it looks like this. And I also tried it to make sure it has the right texture. So once again, it's not too firm or not even al dente, but it's not mushy either. Let's make it pretty. Filipino spaghetti is known for its sweet meat in the sauce and not skimping on it. So make sure you apply a lot of it on top of the pasta. Now it's done and ready to be enjoyed. But if you want it to be extra festive, then feel free to garnish it with vegan cheddar cheese. This goes great for kids' parties. My nephews and nieces go crazy over it. In fact, when I was a kid, I used to go crazy over it as well. And as you could see, the process is really simple, but the result could impress even the biggest meat eaters, which could come in handy, especially if your special occasion is a good mix of meat eaters, vegetarians, and vegans. This way, you have a dish that everyone can enjoy. Thanks so much for watching for the full vegan Filipino spaghetti recipe and other delicious vegan Filipino recipes. Just go on stigvegan.com. I'm also on social media and I would love to see you there, connect with you there. Thanks so much. My name is RG at Vegan, letting you know that Filipino food can be vegan, healthy, and delicious without losing its soul. Kaina, let's eat! Thank you so much, Astig Vegan, for that delightful recipe and bringing an old favorite to life with a vegan twist. Quick reminder that if you're one of the first 12 participants from Vallejo who joins us for all the events for today, we'll be giving you a free vegan cookbook gift box. If you haven't already done so, please fill out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. All right, now next up, I, I invite you to join me on this scenic tour of the Vallejo People's Garden, where we will learn more about the art of growing our own food right in our own backyards or inside our homes. But before we travel to the slice of paradise on Mare Island, let's talk about food deserts or food apartheid and how it impacts Vallejoans. Food apartheid or deserts can be described as a geographic area where residents access to affordable, healthy food options, such as fresh fruits and vegetables, is restricted or non-existent due to the absence of grocery stores within a convenient traveling distance. About 2.3 million Americans, or 2.2% of all U.S. households, live more than one mile away from a supermarket and do not own a car. When Food Empowerment Project began our work in Vallejo, we were connected with Vallejo People's Garden because they had already personally experienced the problem of the lack of access to healthy foods and were working to solve the problem as well. They assisted us with our initial survey into this issue in the community and continue to serve as a perfect example of not only what Vallejo needs more of, but cities around the country desperately deserve and need. Every year at our in-person event, Vallejo's People's Garden has offered free seeds to help people get started growing their own food. And this year, not only will you be inspired to grow your own food, we will blow your minds away at how many different fruits, herbs, and vegetables you can grow right here in Vallejo. The rosemary bushes that grow there are so fragrant and bountiful, you will never want to buy it from a store again. 
Our host for this tour is the mag magnificent Steve Etter. Steve is a resident of Vallejo and a master gardener who spends much of his time at the Vallejo People's Garden, helping to grow organic fruits and vegetables for those facing food insecurity while providing a place for people to learn about sustainable gardening practices. Steve is also passionate about helping to expand the garden's offerings for the community, such as the Meditation Garden. I had an amazing time learning more about the priceless work that Vallejo People's Garden does in our community, and I hope that by the end of this video, you will leave ready to volunteer your time in this magical garden space. Without further ado, let's head over to the Vallejo People's Garden. First up, we're a nonprofit. Everything that we get is through the hard work of volunteers mm -hmm. and donations, mm -hmm. right? So every one of these fruit trees are donated, and they're not as old as you think. That's a cherry tree there. One next to it is uh, a Santa Rosa plum. This is a cherry tree. That's an apricot. That's an apple tree, another heritage apple. That plant growing over there in the um, white barrel yeah. is an almond tree. Oh. Mm. And again, a good example of what you're capable of in your garden. Mm. And, and I try to encourage you people to say, if, even if you only have a balcony, you can have a garden. Like if you got a sun balcony and you want to grow a plant, grow some food. Might right? as well. Yeah, and so that small tree under the, that's a bay laurel, sweet bay for bay leaves. Um, there's a there's an annual mm -hmm. a plant called an annual there's another plant called a biennial mm -hmm. right it'll grow its first year and it'll give you whatever it's going to give you the second year it'll go to seed and it, because it's trying to reproduce and it'll die right so this now is saying I'm done producing broccoli now I'm making some babies the seeds and then it's time to harvest it right so and so a lot of these, I was just having a conversation. When you go by the beds and you see the plants that are flowering now, or you see the seed pods on the plants, that's the plant doing naturally what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Some plants, we call it deadheading. If you, I know, isn't that beautiful? It's so cute. Oh, you, you ain't seen nothing. Only, here's some, bumblebees don't have stingers. Um, they can't hurt you. But they are good pollinators. So what we're doing is we're growing vegetables, we're growing some fruit trees, and the vision is when the garden is up and running at its capacity for us to be able to harvest the food enough for volunteers and enough to give away to uh, uh, people in need. Now there's a, late, there's a couple of ladies here that do harvest some of the greens when they're harvestable and they cook for the, the late women's shelter over in Sacramento. So the luxury of a little small garden like this is we can only grow heirloom tomatoes, mm. which you've seen heirloom tomatoes. They're and gorgeous. Yeah, we, we, had, we had some tomatoes last year that were in the one pound range. Wow. Big, fat, beef, uh, yellows. And, and all of these were donated to us, but we planted all that we need in the garden. But every one of these is an heirloom tomato named variety. What you're gonna do with this before you put it in the ground uh, is take all of this lower stuff off. We're gonna give you some gardening lessons right now, okay? So when you get ready to put it in your in the ground, as a matter of fact, you see it's already producing. You wanna take those off. And the reason is we you don't want, want it to make food right now. You wanna put energy in the grow, right, for roots, right? Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna pop this bad boy out and you're gonna see how the roots are looking, pretty good. And because you, the roots are now growing to where it's confined, but you want to break them up so now they'll grow in a new home, for lack of a better word. So plant it all the way up to where you just stripped it. You're going to plant it up to there, right? It'll stabilize the plant. And now all of these nodes here will produce more roots and it'll help the plant grow better. This is our little melon patch. We got some cantaloupe in here. We got some other named melons, like a honey orange honeydew. Mm. Here in the corner, we have a fig tree. This is a 
line. We're growing some sage here, mm. culinary sage, fig tree. My, my focus is again on teaching people so they can do in their own yard become a little more successful. So if you have a yard and you live in a small space, but you want this fruit tree, you can have that. One of the methods is to grow it against some fence and grow it flat. It's a technique. Ooh. That's an apple, that's an apple. It's a peach. That's a plum. It's a Santa Rosa plum and another fig. But see now, because we force it to grow flat against the, the fence. That's the, how you train it. I, this, these are still babies. They might be three now. So that's the garden. Over here, in this area, we are trying to build what we're calling a sanctuary garden. So the idea was to put together a garden that was um, a place people could come and relax. And we built a deck here, ostensibly for people to do yoga and Pilates and Tai Chi. And we're not done yet. We just, we just built a handicap ramp for it and putting the stairs on. And we'll put, we'll put a railing around it. And then we'll start planting some more plants. But again, some ornamentals and some food. Right? So in that container over there, that's taro root. This is a mango. And it was so, but these are babies. And you can see the flowers, so it wants to produce fruit. But last year, this actually had mangoes on it. We sheet mulched it. But anyway, so this side, we're planting some exotics. It's, it's like, again, that plant right there. Kefir lime? No, that's a thing called a pawpaw. It, it tastes like a cross between a mango and a banana. From here to that bridge, we're going to call this the dedication garden. So we're dedicating one of the young men that volunteered here. He passed away and they donated $5,000 to the garden in his name. Wow. So we're going to dedicate a tree in honor of him. Yeah. And then box next to it, another guy passed away. And so that we're going to put a... Um, that's a vitex, which is, has a religious connotation to it. Uh, the other one, we're gonna put a olive tree, which has a religious connotation. From this area here, going this way, it's gonna be our butterfly garden. Ultimately, when it's all sheet mulch, we're gonna have a couple picnic tables here, mm -hmm. with a couple umbrellas. We're gonna put some uh, shade sails over the deck. And we want to have People come here and do their morning Pilates or do their morning yoga and sit around the picnic table and have, you know. So when we, uh, we will be doing classes, we have some guest speakers that are coming. Uh, what we're trying to do is have people come and help us, the subject matter experts, to talk to, uh, to, talk to us about how to grow rosemary or herbs. So anyway, that's it. Thank you so much, Steve. The Vallejo People's Garden is on the corner of Oscar and East Poplar Streets. If you'd like to volunteer your time, please check out their website and contact information at the bottom of your screen. Next up, we have yours truly talking about being a vegan in Vallejo and more importantly, talking about being vegan for the animals. Please join me as we visit a windy downtown Vallejo to talk about how to eat vegan in Vallejo and why the animals are so appreciative with every plant-based bite you take. Let's go for a spin. Hello everyone, my name is Erica and I'm so excited today to talk to you about my vegan journey and just to give you some inspiration about how it all began. So I first, I have been vegan for five years this October and my vegan journey started in undergraduate school and college and someone gave me a pamphlet asking me, do you want to help animals? And I'm like, yes, I want to help animals. And so when I opened up the pamphlet, it showed how chickens, pigs, um, cows, how they live in such terrible conditions. And I didn't want to be a part of the problem. 
So I began by transi transitioning to pescatarian. Anyone know what a pescatarian is? Yes, they only eat fish and seafood. So I started out doing things like, you know, shrimp alfredo and like fried fish and stuff like that. And uh, I moved back home to Vallejo from, from college for the summer. And I struggled, really struggled because I didn't know what to eat or where I was going to get it from. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have a very like big diet or big palate yet. So I went back to eating meat. And then in 2016, I started my transition journey. So how did that work? I made my house vegan, but I ate whatever outside. And I, as I was eating whatever outside, I would look for more vegan options where I went. So if I went to Taco Bell, I was like, oh, if I sub out the beef for the beans for the crunch wrap, that's vegan. And then I would take, I was gradually start taking off the dairy, uh, gradually start taking off the cheese and stuff till I was ordering completely vegan. And so this whole process took me about like a year, a year and a half to go from eating everything to eating vegan. And to me, I don't have a dietary restriction. I am not restricted. I have a dietary need or a dietary preference to not eat animal products. And so now that I've been vegan for almost five years, I am doing so amazing when it comes to finding new things. I'm eating so many other foods, uh, so many foods from other cultures like sushi and Indian food and Ethiopian food, even like so many amazing things from Mexican and other Latinx cultures that I get to eat. I had amazing empanadas the other day um, and uh, tacos, con pa uh, papas, like t potato tacos. Love all of that. So yes, um, it was a very interesting journey. And so, you know, once I started eating vegan outside the house, um, as well as keeping my home vegan, it was super easy. So here I am five years later, I'm still doing it. And next I'm going to share with you, you know, how to eat vegan Vallejo and even more tips. So, so now let's talk about eating vegan in Vallejo. What are some vegan options in Vallejo? So my number one recommendation is obviously Miss Renee. She is also known as Vegan Heat. You can find her on DoorDash as well as Yelp and I, she has amazing stellar reviews. So one of the things I love that vegan, uh, vegan Heat or Renee makes is her Destiny sauce. It's this green Mediterranean like spicy creamy sauce. It is amazing. It goes so good on her empanadas. And she makes so many different kind of cuisine. She makes Mexican food. She makes Mediterranean food. She makes Thai vegan chicken fried rice. And, so, and of course she makes soul food. Her mac and cheese is phenomenal as well as her vegan ribs, which she is also very well known for. So if you're not ordering from Vegan Heat or going to one of her mini pop-ups or the mini events, you should also look at different cultures so, like I said, I like to eat Indian food, Japanese food, Chinese food, um, and even there's ways to veganize your favorites like tomato soup and grilled cheese as well. So if you want to eat out, um, I love going to Indian restaurants. What do I get at Indian restaurants? I always go straight to the vegetarian section of the menu, and I will always make sure that the food I'm getting is made without ghee or I think it's clarified butter. So that's what I do when I order out when I eat Indian food. If I'm going for Chinese or Japanese, um, I'll make sure it's made without bonito flakes, which is like fish flakes, um, the fish product. And if I'm eating Chinese food um, or Thai food, for example, I'll always make sure it's made without fish sauce and without oyster sauce and without egg. So it's really simple just to make these little substitutions, these little tweaks to your food when you're eating anything from the Asian cuisine. Uh, when it comes to Mexican and other Latinx foods, I always check to make sure it's made without like chicken and things like that. I'll make sure that my beans are being made without lard and stuff like that. So it's really easy to get like a big juicy burrito with beans, lettuce, and um, tahita veggies, all those amazing things that you go out to eat for uh, Mexican or Latinx cuisine. For dinner, um, it's easy to make spaghetti, stir fries, a whole bunch of different things. I've made a really good vegan lasagna um, that I make for dinner and I take the next day for work. So make sure you check out your grocery stores for vegan options. There's so many now. They're everywhere. So, you know, now that we've talked a little bit about my journey, what I eat when I'm here in Vallejo, um, what do I love about veganism? So five years later, I'll have to admit when the journey first started, 
one of my biggest fears was that I'll never eat at another family gathering, another office potluck, another, you know, like a camping event or whatever. And then I realized once I started sharing with people, oh yeah, I'm, you know, a vegan now. Um, everyone just kind of rallied around me. People would like find like, oh yeah, my cousin's vegan or, oh, I know a vegan recipe that I can bring you. It doesn't have any, you know, da, 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 da. so it was really nice how my community really rallied around me. My family always brings something for me that's vegan um, every holiday gathering. So it's really been an amazing way that I've changed not only my life, but the lives of those around me. Um, I've had really, you know, great benefits throughout my life when it comes to veganism, but the greatest impact for me has been um, my impact with the animals. I am a huge animal lover. I have worked with cows. Um, I've worked with elephants. I've worked with dogs. I have a dog. And so for me, the biggest part of my heart that really gets touched is that the fact that I'm not hurting animals and animals byproducts are not coming into my body. I don't eat honey. I don't drink dairy. Like, you know, I don't eat cheese and things like that. So for me, really being able to know that there's one less animal that's being hurt or harmed or their life is being ended early for my personal consumption really means a lot to me as well as um, I'm not just what me and my friend have coined as a stomach vegan. I'm also um, a fashion vegan as well. I don't wear leather. I don't wear suede um, or anything like that. And, you know, my car is technically vegan. I don't have leather seats in my car. Um, so that's just how I have... Um, pursued and how I live my veganism, but my encouragement and my wish for you is that you can try it out by ordering a beefless, sour creamless, uh, crunch wrap supreme from Taco Bell, or going to your local restaurant and getting something that doesn't have meat or dairy in it, and you'll be surprised how good it really is. You're going to learn. I've learned to love cooking going um, through veganism. I was always afraid to cook meat as a kid because I always thought I was going to give myself salmonella. But now I get to cook things. I get to be, get really creative in the kitchen. I eat as much as guacamole as I want, and I don't feel bad about it because avocados are amazing and we live in California. So you'd be really surprised how many things you can already have um, that you really don't even have to change that much um, going vegan. And I think, like I said, the biggest part of veganism that really matters to me is how I've impacted and saved so many lives of animals and how I'm benefiting the environment as well by using less water uh, via animal agriculture. So there's so many benefits for not only you, but the animals and the planet when you choose um, a more compassionate and vegan uh, friendly lifestyle. So that's it. My name is Erica and thank you so much for joining us for this year's Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed our stroll around downtown Vallejo and talked and why we talked a little bit about why animals are such an important part of a vegan lifestyle and a compassionate diet. Now, as we begin our celebration of Latinx Heritage Month, we are sure you will not be able to sit in your seat for this next performance. Get ready for a colorful, toe-tapping, smile-inducing performance by the group Quetzali Bale Folklorico Vallejo. Ballet Folk Rico has been a regular performer at our Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. It is such an honor to have them perform at our event as we believe that it truly enriches and celebrates some of the diversity of Vallejo. And when else do you get to see performances like this at a vegan event? Gazali Ballet Folk Rico is a local Vallejo group that has been performing together for over five years in Solano County and other various Bay Area cities. They are a group of loving mothers who are keeping their Mexican culture alive by teaching their daughters the art of dancing. The dances you are about to see are from the Mexican states of Veracruz and Jalisco. Without further ado, it is now time to enjoy the vibrant energy and dedication, dedication of these amazing young women. Please join me in welcoming Quetzali Bale Folklorico Vallejo.
Thank you for that energetic performance. What an amazing display of color and culture. Another round of applause for Quetzale Bale Focorico Vallejo. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Lauren Ornelas and Helen Marie Cookie Gordon. Lauren is going to introduce us to Cookie Gordon and share a little bit about FEP's work in the Vallejo community. So please join me and welcome Lauren Ornelas and Helen Marie Cookie Gordon. Hey, Erica. Oh, I lost my Erica. Thank you for doing such an amazing job as always with this event. We really are so thankful to have you and um, everything you do for Vallejo and for the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. And I really love the segment you did on veganism and the animals, because as you know, that's a big part of why Food Empowerment Project is a vegan organization. So um, anyway, just a quick thank you to you and thanks to everybody for showing up this year. As I'm sure you know, in years past, this event was in person. Um, but due to COVID and wanting to take all precautions, we, we feel necessary last year and this year, we decided to do it virtually. So we very much appreciate all of you who are, you know, maybe not tasting all the delicious vegan food and dancing along, or maybe you are dancing along um, to um, Quetzale Boclorico, but um, we really appreciate you participating in any way that you can this year. And again, if you have not signed up to get one of the free vegan cookbooks, please do. Um, so I just want to, before I introduce um, Erica's interview with Cookie, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on our work in Vallejo. Um, so Food Empowerment Project actually started working in Vallejo by a request from David Hilliard, one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party, told us about the predicament he felt Vallejo was in concerning lack of access to healthy foods. So um, we had done previous work in Santa Clara County and in San Jose in particular on it, and decided to put those tools into place in Vallejo. So we did um, what we've done before, which is we gathered up volunteers and we physically went out and surveyed every establishment except for restaurants and fast food. Um, so we surveyed gas stations and liquor stores and grocery stores and convenience stores just to determine what types of food they had available in the community. And we chose just to do Vallejo because if you live there, you know that community is very different than the rest of Solano County. So we went out and we did the serving of the community and we put out a report on our findings and um, found what a lot of you already know that Vallejo as a whole does not have much access to healthy foods and it's much worse in the black and brown community areas. And so we put out um, the report, we shared it with amazing organizations like Vallejo People's Garden um, to try to get them more funding for the important work that they do. We also provided it to a, um, like a array of policymakers from local to federal policymakers to make sure they understood how dire the situation was in, in Vallejo. After that, we went and we did, these reports are available on our website in English and Spanish. Um, but we then went out and we did focus groups because we know that many times well-intentioned people start to tell black and brown communities what it is that they need without asking the communities themselves. So we did focus groups. I believe we did about six in Vallejo, maybe seven. Um, one was conducted all in Spanish. And these, um, the focus groups really, we basically went and said, you know, what are the barriers that you experience? What do you see as some potential solutions? And uh, we fed everybody vegan food and we paid everybody $50 for their time. Again, the knowledge that we were getting from the community members was, was priceless, right? It was important and we wanted to, to value and appreciate the time that they donated to the organization. So we did give everybody $50 for their time and we did the focus groups, making sure that we included it in the Latinx community. One was done all in Spanish the Black community, the Filipino community. We also did um, the seniors living in the area. And we also did, um, because Maria Gavera um, did so much work um, on friends who live in Vallejo, meaning those who are experiencing homelessness, that we also did an entire focus group with that community as well. And what we found was that many people, um, unfortunately, who were getting food from some of the food banks in the community were getting rotten food and moldy food we found that people were wanting access to healthy foods. They just couldn't get it in their community. The fact that, you know, a lot of which you're gonna hear Cookie talk about. One of the things we mentioned when we did our um, focus group was the potential of doing something like a worker-owned cooperative. 
And just so you know, there's a difference between a worker-owned cooperative and a membership-owned cooperative. So a membership-owned cooperative could mean that the owners could live in Benicia or somewhere else, but they own the cooperative in Vallejo. We wanted a worker-owned cooperative in Vallejo so that the owners live in the community and they make the decisions on what's happening with their profits. They also can make decisions that they feel best benefit the community. And in all the focus groups that we did, only one person had ever heard of a worker-owned cooperative, and that was Cookie Gordon. Um, she's the only one who knew about it, was completely enthusiastic about it. I'm gonna back up a little bit before I go on about Cookie. Um, one of the things that we found as well in doing our own our, um, report was that Safeway, which many of you may have known, was located in downtown, which there's now a grocery outlet. For 15 years, there was no grocery store in that area because Safeway had actually put a restrictive deed on that property saying no grocery store could move into that community for 15 years. You can look this up online. Vallejo um, Times Herald did a number of articles on it, um, focusing on the damage this actually had to the community. We talk about it in our report, but there's a quote from a, a woman living in the area whose daughter never knew what it was like to even have a grocery store in her area. So we have a petition on Safeway, a national campaign actually now against Safeway because of what it is that they did to the community of Vallejo. Because we found out it's not just Vallejo that they've done this to. They've done it in Colorado. They've done it in Washington, D.C. They're attempting to do it in Washington State in an area that is predominantly um, farm worker community members. So this isn't a by accident thing that's happening. This is something that Safeway is deliberately doing that's harming the health of community members. So we ask you to please sign this petition and spread the word. We need to change. Yes, absolutely, Aubrey. It's a despicable practice. It's an inexcusable practice that's harming the health of communities. So we need everybody's help to try to stop them from doing this. So um, we can talk about this more. We do have leaflets and posters available, um, but if, if people could just sign that petition, we would be very, very grateful because Safeway needs to hear. So just quickly going back to Cookie Gordon, the only one who had heard anything about worker-owned cooperatives, she then was in for the fight. She jumped in with both feet and was ready. Um, she came out, we did three meetings in um, Vallejo talking about what a worker-owned cooperative is. Adriana from Mandela Grocery Cooperative in Oakland came out did talks about what it is that they do, how it benefits the workers, how they work to benefit the community. Cookie was at each and every one of them, ready to get involved, and she still has been. Also, when candidates were running for office, prior to her running for office, she was there to demand answers from city council members or, and as well as people who were wanting to run for city council, asking them the hard questions about how could they let Safeway had done the, do this to the community. So um, I really encourage you, thank you, Aubrey, for signing the petition. Um, really encourage you to please listen to the things that you're hearing Cookie speak about in this interview, because what she's talking about isn't limited to Vallejo. It takes place across the country and predominantly in black and brown and indigenous communities. But more importantly, community, uh, uh, what Cookie's talking about is what you can do and demanding that policymakers take this seriously and listen. And we're very, very grateful for all that Cookie has done and continues to do for the community and definitely for her bringing attention to this issue. And if you live in Vallejo and you don't experience what Cookie is going through, please know that it's not just Cookie. There are many people who live in your community who need you to speak out so this type of stuff doesn't happen in our backyards anymore. So thank you for listening to me and please enjoy this powerful interview with Cookie Gordon. Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Erica Hazel and I have the pleasure of being joined by Helen Marie Cookie Gordon, and she is here today to talk to us about the access to healthy foods in the city of Vallejo. Hi, Helen, and I'm going to be calling her Cookie throughout. So hi, Cookie. How are you? I'm doing excellent. It's so nice to meet you, Erica. And now, is that the proper way of pronouncing your name? Yes, Erica. Beautiful. Awesome. So can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? So a little bit about myself. Uh, I moved here to Vallejo in uh, 2005. I came here homeless. 
uh, with my family of five. Uh, and um, I just fell in love with the city because of the fact that they helped out. Uh, I've been in my residence that I've lived there since 2007. I've been a community advocate and an activist, um, also a bridger, uh, which that mean is I connect folks to folks to help make changes. Um, not necessarily to get recognition, but just to put people together. You know, no sense uh, recreating the wheel uh, to a wagon if it's already just needs to be fixed or it's already one there. I also am a mother of four. I have seven grandchildren and a host of uh, uh, nieces and nephews in my community. So um, they always come back and check on me. Um, I also ran for city council. I didn't quite make that vote uh, where I like to be, but however, I'm now I'm a commissioner for housing. I've uh, also been uh, recognized by our assembly members, senators, and also Congress members, and also community members with host awards for being involved in communities. And I feel like you're the part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I, if there's a problem, try to be part of that solution. Absolutely. I love everything you just said. And I really think it speaks to the heart that you have uh, for the city of Vallejo. Thank you so much for that. And so my follow-up question is, to that is when we think about the access to healthy foods uh, in the city of Vallejo, mm -hmm. what really, you know, what comes to mind for you? You know, um, do you have a hard time accessing healthy foods near where you live? You know, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking. One of our complications that we have, so when I moved here in 2007 in this particular location, um, the only access we had was the liquor store, mm -hmm. um, AKA corner stores, you know, and that's unfortunate. I would send my children to the store to get uh, some bread, you know, just something to hold us off until we can take the bus. And at that time the bus was, uh, convenient in a way, transportation, but to come back home was difficult because you'd have to take multiple uh, buses to get to a reasonable grocery store, um, which for example, I would have to take bus one to get to bus six to take me to Safeway over by Highway 80. Mm -hmm. Now, even in a vehicle, that's still a lot. Um, so anyways, uh, it was not the uh, a great idea because my sons were introduced to, to behaviors that I didn't want them to see at such a young age at that point. So I felt like, in my opinion, uh, to be here 2007 to now, and as I ran my campaign, I found out that they've been trying to get a grocery store here since 1985, the year that I graduated. I'm 55 years old now. So anyways, um, and I don't understand what the problem is. There's a big property that was commercialized only and was supposed to put a grocery store there. Now they made it residential. And so for what? Just, you know, why, why are you not making sure the South area of Vallejo can have healthy food and to be known at the state level that we are a food desert? And everyone says it so freely, even during their campaign but no one's done anything about it. You know what, you bring up a lot of good points, like about how many buses you had to take to find a decent grocery store and even how um, it's been years, decades since, you know, that this has been going on for, and like you said, just want to clarify the community of South Vallejo, correct? Correct, that's correct. Yeah, and I definitely um, resonate when I hear the word food desert and how like it almost, uh, here at Food Empowerment Project, we use the term uh, uh, food apartheid because it seems it's really just a choice to not put healthy grocery Absolutely. stores in these communities. Absolutely. That's a very good incentive words. Even if they were to have put a reliable um, market. So this is what happened. Uh, one of our political uh, persons said, oh, well, we have the grocery outlet. That's mid downtown. Do you understand? You still got to take a bus there. Then if you get the bus, you have to wait a, right a whole hour now because it goes all through Grand Cove to get to here. 
And then with the freeway being, um, you know, Highway Magazine now being um, being re renovated, revamped, um, they have to really go out their way. So you got groceries, you surely can't buy no no, no ice or, you know, uh, ice pops for your children, you know, especially when it's being so hot. And this property does not offer air conditioning. So you definitely can't do that. And you can, uh, I've seen a lot of our young people from Maritime Academy walk to there, but to come back home with bags, they regretted that. I offered a lot of them home, get, you know, rise home. And and first they said no. And then when I came back, I said, are you sure? Like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll take it. Because they realized that they have a long ways to walk back home, to walk up Sonoma Boulevard, Highway 99. So yeah, it's difficult. You're absolutely right. The transportation is, is by far the shockest because I just found out, and now check this out, Monday through Friday, bus every hour. But Saturday and sun, Sunday, no bus because of COVID. But the other community have bus. Really? That's the part that got me. Now, Sunday, they didn't have bus. And, uh, but now you're going to take away Saturday, too. And you say because of COVID. But yet other communities have within Vallejo transportation. Up to yin yang. But we don't. That makes no sense. And so you're pointing out a lot of the issues that are definitely specific to the community of South Vallejo and the disparities between the different areas of Vallejo. And seeing as you're a longtime activist in the community, what do you see are some of the solutions? To be honest with you, I have to give a darn. And that's me being nice. You have to really care. And so we had this district-wide voting this, you know, that just took place so that communities like this would not get neglected. And so far. We've been into positions since our commander's uh, leadership has been in position since January. And I've seen already a new person get on board in her community, District 3, already got the roads being done. She's got, she's got the fire station opening up. But yet, and then on where my where District 6 representative lived, she's getting all Springs uh, Town fixed up, Springs mm -hmm. Road. But yet, South Vallejo is being neglected. Yeah. And what has been done is because me being activated uh, into full force about this road getting fixed, we got that done. Wheelchair cuts, got that done because my son got hurt in the wheelchair. But yet we can't get a grocery store. So I reached out to my representative just recently that we need, and then talking about having farmer market. Okay, that's beautiful. But why can't we have a grocery store? A whole store. There's one, there's one sitting on top of one, in in North in District Three and District Four. You got you got them sitting on District One, sitting on top of each other. But nothing. I don't understand it. They're building a whole new Costco, right in the same District Air uh, One, and there's already one there. So why not take that money and talk Costco to come on this side of the wood? I don't, I don't understand that. Yes. And I think that you make so many great points about some of the, the, like we said, the disparities between the different areas of Vallejo and how, um, South Vallejo is being left behind in terms of accessing healthy foods in Vallejo in general, overall, do you think that things have gotten better or worse in the last few years? Oh, so unfortunate to have to say it's gotten worse. Okay. They, they think, they think their solution is providing, a list of food banks. They're, they're having, yes, so grateful to have the food truck, I mean, excuse me, the uh, the uh, Casa Casa food bank that provides fruits. That is really wonderful. Um, down the street, you get that every other Tuesday. Uh, and, and that's nice. Uh, but for people who uh, work, they can't take advantage of that because it's only one hour. Number two, uh, they can't take advantage of it because it's from two to three. During the workday. Yes. And then they can't take advantage of it because if they don't have transportation, that's it. You know, you can get there. You're, you're fortunate to walk there, but you cannot um, carry that all that stuff back home. You know, especially over here in this, this corner. But on 6th Street, I met a lady uh, 
who've been in the community, I guess, for a long time. Uh, I guess when one of our famous uh, singers named the Commodores were here, one, I guess one, I can, if I'm saying it right. And when the neighborhood was really up to par and was known to be the best, uh, they have been fighting to get a grocery store here. Mm -hmm. You know, they noticed there was not being taken care of or given uh, the best of care in this area and always have to be a fight. Yeah. So she said, she, she said um, that her great, great granddaughter um, want to come back home and give back to her community, but the, it got exhausting. Mm. Got exhausting. And she's a, she's a veg, vegetarian. She uh, wanted to have healthy foods for her children. And so her great granddaughter came to help her mom, her grandmother for a while and just couldn't take it no more. You know, you have to hop in a car and let's take a trip to the grocery store, everyone. You know, a trip, like going, going out on a, you know, out of town. And to yeah. get healthy foods, she has to go to, like she's a Trader Joe person. Mm. She has to go out of the community, out of the city to go to the nearest one, wherever that's at. Yes. So there's definitely a disparity and a lack of, um, support for healthy foods in South Vallejo in particular. And it's been, like you said, a decades long problem. Uh, Miss Cookie, this has been a really great conversation. I want to just close with, is there any wishes or if there, you know, if someone was listening who could make this change overnight, like what would, what would you want them to hear? What would you want them to know? I want them to know that it should not be a privilege to have food. It should be a right to have healthy food. You are in the office to listen to your people. You need to take that consideration. If you keep build up all of your community, your equity will go up. You would bring up, bring great clientele. You could bring great, great residents, visitors, because they know we are right here all on and off the freeway ramp where people could take advantage of healthy foods. Uh, you know, co-op grocery store for our community be great because our city will benefit from that because people are local working there. Um, and they know that we're supporting other community members who may provide healthy strawberries. You know, we are, we'll be taking care of our community a sense of pride. And if they could just hear that would be great and, and stop sitting on it and, and dangling in front of us like a, like a 24 karat, you know, carrot. Come on, it just, and I'm willing to be part of it. If you could understand, our kids can see nothing but liquor stores. It says something to them that they're not valuable and that you buy food from the, the from the corner store that you just seen them at smart and final the word final and you buy it it's rotten at times if you froze it's frozen you don't find out to actually defrost it the bread is hard you can use it as a hammer just hear our cry and have empathy and help us yeah it, it's not difficult no, you're absolutely right. Thank you so much for all the passion you brought to this interview. Thank you so much for all the solutions and words that you brought. And I hope that the right people are hearing and we can make a difference in our community. Again, thank you so much, Helen Marie, Cookie Gordon. It was great to have you. Have an amazing day. Absolutely the same for me too. Thank you. Take care. It's nice meeting you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you so much to Cookie and Lauren for reminding us to continue to fight for healthy foods in all of our communities. Before we close today's event, we're going to give you a moment to post your questions now through the Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to get through as many of them as possible before we run out of time. While you're typing, I would like to remind you that Food Empowerment Project is looking for a full-time, one-term Vallejo Community Organizer, or VCO, to work closely with the community of Vallejo, 
and FEP's team to help with a variety of programs and campaigns that align with our mission and support the communities and FEP's goals. Please click the link below to read more about it. And a reminder that if you're one of the first 12 participants from Vallejo who joins the events this and next Saturday, next Sunday, we'll be giving you a free vegan cookbook gift box. If you haven't already done so, please fill out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. So we'll give you a moment to post those questions in the Q&A box and then we'll get started. I love reading all the comments in the chat. This is awesome. All right, let's see. So I would like to welcome on screen with me, Lauren Ornelas, because we're gonna answer some of your questions. Lauren, there is a question in our Q&A box that I really, you kind of touched on a little bit earlier when we were talking about when you were introducing Helen Marie Cookie, but the question is just curious, why was the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest started? So do you wanna say a little bit more like to bring that to a close? You wanna say a little more about that? Sure, thanks. Um, well, I think I wanted to start the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest because, well, one, I didn't know how much experience people had in the community with a variety of vegan foods. Um, and making sure that the vegan foods that we shared were things that people could buy in the community, knowing that it wasn't, a community that had a lot of access to, to vegan alternatives and things like that. Um, and just really quick shout out that um, Chef Evangelina, who is tuning in right now, was, was a chef many times at our Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. Um, thank you for that. And thanks for all the delicious food you made. So I wanted to share just a variety of culturally appropriate foods too, right? To actually have an event just for the community of Vallejo. And also spotlight, you know, some of the wisdom um, of the people who live in the community and to celebrate the community. You know, I went to events in Vallejo before our event and was just really moved by the, the power, the, the passion, the diversity, and the love uh, that people in the community had for Vallejo. And again, you know, our first, what, how many, you've been doing this with us for two years, three years now, Erica, um, and this is our sixth. So the first three were done by Maria Guevara, who really was, you know, in love with Vallejo. And so a lot of that was infectious. And so it was, you know, after our first event, we also wanted to make sure everybody knew about our report and our findings that everybody had the right to know what was happening in the community when it came to accessing healthy foods. And when we asked the community, like, do you want us to do another one? And everybody was overwhelmingly said yes. So that's why we've come back and done more every year since. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we have another question for you, Lauren. Uh, thank you so much for sharing about food empowerment projects work in Vallejo. What could we ask policymakers to do in Vallejo? It's a great question. Um, you know, we've tried <laughs> repeatedly to work with the mayor, to work with um, different city council members on various things, and it has been not easy. Um, we feel like we get meetings with them, but we don't get any changes. Um, so I think that, you know, what everybody can do is contact your city council member, contact the mayor, and make sure that you let them know that this is important to you. You want to see changes. We have tried to get uh, some type of policy passed to make sure that Safeway doesn't harm the community again. We can never seem to get anywhere with that in Vallejo, even though it's a community that was gravely impacted by Safeway. Um, we even have a, an example of an ordinance that can be passed, um, but we really encourage you to contact them, but also contact us. Let us know if you want to be more involved, especially with us hiring a community organizer um, from Vallejo. We definitely want to do more, so we want to know if you want to work with us more closely um, to change the situation in Vallejo. Absolutely. And what's the best way for folks to get in, talk, in contact with Food Empowerment Project? Um, they can put something in the chat box here, or you can email us at info, I-N-F-O, at foodispower.org. If you're more of a phone person, give us a call, 707-779-8004. Um, Any way you want to communicate with us, we want to communicate with you. Thanks, Erica.
Awesome. All right. I have a couple more questions for you, Lauren, but um, one of the questions we got in the chat was, Erica, thank you for your wonderful segment on being vegan for animals. What's your favorite place to eat vegan food in Vallejo? That's a great question. Um, one of our, one of my favorite places, um, they're no longer here. It was the pho restaurant on Sonoma Boulevard where we went for lunch that one day. They're not around anymore? Oh no. Um, but luckily I'm speaking with the owner um, online. So they, they actually had to relocate to Sonoma County of all places, right? <laughs> So yeah, the pho restaurant's no longer there, but if you go to a pho restaurant, you can always order their tofu dishes. I love a really good tofu spring roll um, with the peanut sauce on the side. Um, vegetable broth is your friend. So if they have a ve vegetable broth dish, that's always a major go-to of mine. I love eating Thai food and Indian food. So um, luckily, you know, we have Taj Grill on Admiral Callahan here in Vallejo off the freeway. And when it comes to eating, you know, um, really awesome Thai food, you can really try anywhere you, you know, may have in your neighborhood or that's local to you. And you just have to omit the fish sauce, the oyster sauce, and the egg. And that often veganizes a lot of Thai dishes really easily. I love a pad ki mao or a pad si u. That's my favorite Thai food that I really love to get um, in and around town. I believe Maya Thai is now in the pho places um, restaurant. Oh. On yeah, the place that was next door, they took over that space. So, and yeah. there's also another Thai place that does vegan stuff by um, down by Barry's Bridal. Oh, further down, mm -hmm. um, Broadway. Yes, thank you. I don't yeah. always remember my streets. That place would always do vegan stuff for us too. Another good Thai place. Awesome. Yeah, there's so many easy ways to veganize. And then there's provisions downtown. They often have a vegan um, vegan menu items at provisions uh, right next to the Empress Theater in downtown Vallejo. The farmer's market is always a really favorite go to of mine. You'd be surprised how many vendors are doing dairy free, animal free options, which I'm always impressed by, like the kettle corn people. Um, so there's often so many vegan options in the city of Vallejo. It's just a matter of knowing what you're going to like omit or what you're going to order um so yeah there's there's a lot of options thank you so much for asking that and your local grocery stores often will have items that are have the little v circle and i'll say vegan on the pack on the different things in the grocery stores as well too that you can buy and make at home thank you for that question um the next question was how can we contact cookie or other local activists to get involved what other locals uh, local organizations should we know about? Well, contact us because um, we're definitely not going to give out cookies personal information, which I'm sure everybody understands, um, but get in touch with us. Um, we definitely have a list of other people in Vallejo who we work with. Um, Vallejo People's Garden is definitely one of our partners in all of this and have been since the beginning. Um, I guess uh, Erica, isn't there an organization that your father is with that does good work too? Oh, the African American Alliance, the uh, NAACP as well. Um, yeah, there's a few organizations in Vallejo that are doing um, this activist work that are trying to make our communities healthier and safer for everyone. Awesome, thank you, Lauren. Um, so the next question, and Lauren, I feel like you can answer this one too. What is your favorite place to eat vegan food in the Bay Area? Um, I just stuffed oh. my face yesterday, but you can go for first. No, I'm wondering if we should break it up by area by area. Where did you stuff your face at yesterday? I went to San Francisco. I was on the peninsula yesterday. I drove to Brisbane, <laughs> Brisbane, um, from Berkeley to Brisbane, which is about 30 minutes without traffic, 25 minutes without traffic. I went to Chef Reina's, who also oh, has. Yes. Uh, done a cooking demo at the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. Um, I had Ponce Bihon. I got garlic rice. I got a uh, vegan Spam Masubi. And I also had a really good, what was it? Oh, Tocino, which is like um, the vegan version is vegan pork. It's uh, in a red. Mm. So I had all of that. And then I went to closer to the Chase Center in Mission Bay of San Francisco. And I went to uh, the Syrup shop. So I had a lot of Filipino food yesterday. Um, <laughs> yeah. Amazing tofu sisig over Italian carbonara pasta. What? It was a the sig -sig wow. was amazing. So I got that. And then I had dinner with some friends and I had vegan pizza. I had vegan macaroni and cheese pizza, vegan sausage pizza. Jeez. 
a bunch of Filipino at Ube bunt cakes yesterday. It was amazing. So I, I hit up San Francisco yesterday. Yeah, you did. You just said that went over there to eat, it sounds like, huh? Uh, well, we have, I'm sure, and we can put it in there, we have veganfilipinofood.com, which is in English and Tagalog on our website. And of course, vegan Mexican food um, in English and in Spanish. And we also have vegan Lao food, which is in English on our website and hopefully in Laos soon. Um, I like, I mean, if I like sandwiches, I mean, remember FEP also has our chocolate list of chocolate we do and do not recommend. So personally, I love going to Butcher Sun because they have delicious vegan sandwiches and their chocolate is all FEP recommended. So I can eat all the vegan donuts that I want and eat chocolate if I want to and have their vegan hot chocolate. Um, but I really do love their sandwiches. Um, and of course, love solely vegan, love the Ethiopian places in Oakland as well. Um, here, I live in San Jose. So we're very lucky to have Delatiera here. Um, <laughs> it was really great. We just lost our Jaguar bakery, um, but they were also another favorite. Um, but we do have a vegan donut shop here. And um, there's just a lot. I mean, I came from living in Sonoma County and Amy's drive through was the best. Um, but now living in San Jose, there's just so many vegan places out here. Um, but, you know, I know that there's some closer in Vallejo as well, but yeah, it's so funny because I am actually friends with Jaguar Baker. I actually hung out with her last night. So they will be back. They're only on a hiatus. So Jaguar Baker will be back very soon. Uh, De La Tierra is amazing as well. I had their carne asada burrito last weekend. It was so- We had, we had their burrito with sorizo and potatoes last night. So- <laughs> right. The go-to, it's so amazing. Um, Vegetarian house, yep. Right. Um, there's so many options here. They're close by here um, on this side of the Carquinas Bridge. Um, there's Fox and Fawn Bakehouse in Venetia. And when I think about even if I'm going a little bit further north, um, Sacramento has a very um, evolving um, vegan scene as well. If you ever find yourself in Sacramento, um, if you just Google vegan options in Sacramento, you'll see a lot a lot, a lot of places coming up. And I'm really excited about that. My new thing is um, they're called Nixta Foods, N-I-X-T-A. They make the best vegan pupusas I've ever had in my life. So good. They're curtido, they're crema. So good. Wow. Um, looks like Chef Evangelina posted a new place in Vallejo too. That is good to know. Oh, right on Broadway too. Fantastic. I'm going to have to go check them out later. I know. Too. Thank you, Chef Evangelina. Anybody else have recommendations they want to share with everybody about places in Vallejo where you've been getting your um, vegan goods at? Right. Please share. And while we're waiting for those to come in, um, I think this question kind of already got answered a little bit, but I want to pivot back to, um, you know, access to healthy foods, Lauren, what could, what could we ask policymakers specifically to do in Vallejo um, when it comes to like the Vallejo community organizer position and like your, the food empowerment projects campaign with shame on Safeway? Like what are some concrete things that we, that you would suggest get changed in Vallejo? Well, one of the things is definitely passing a policy to make sure that no grocery ever, ever does what Safeway did to the community. The second thing would be making sure that we get these bus routes figured out. Um, Cookie was definitely discussing some outrageous problems that are taking place right now with buses not running. Um, but I would say that making sure that the bus routes are in ways that are convenient for people to go to and from places to get healthy food. It'd be great to have more policies passed to allow um, more access to land for people to grow their own food, either in their front yards, their backyards, offer some trainings, some tools to help people, Vallejo People's Garden, I'm sure could help, maybe getting Vallejo People's Garden more funding to do the important work that they do in the community, that they have an amazing, beautiful resource in the community and people who have dedicated so much of their lives as volunteers to get that garden off the ground and to get those people in positions to where they can help other people in the community grow their own food. And if there's anything you know, just as important is making that living wage is a part of reality in Vallejo. We have found that in our work, we found that living wages is one of the biggest barriers for people accessing healthy foods because they simply don't have the money to afford it. It's not even as much the distance that people have to travel is simply the money. And like Cookie was saying, like 
you know, um, about these farmers markets. Well, you know, let's make sure these farmers markets at times that people can actually go to them. Let's make sure the farmers markets are also in every language, trilingual farmers markets when they advertise them. Let's make sure that all of these things are being run by the community first, not by policymakers, not even by NGOs, but people in the community can make these decisions and talk about what will really have a good impact on their lives and their health. Absolutely. And a lot of what you were saying made me think about last year's uh, Vallejo Healthy Food Festival when we had Mandela Grocery Co-op and we took a tour of the co-op in West Oakland um, near the West Oakland BART station. So when we think about, you know, you, and you mentioned this a little bit when you introduced Cookie, talking about the difference between a member owned and a community, you know, the differences, what, what would be your vision kind of like for a food cooperative in the city of Vallejo? I would love to see a worker-owned cooperative definitely in South Vallejo, but also maybe more than that in the community, but a, a cooperative that's getting, that's sourcing their food from local growers, black and brown farmers in the area, maybe people in Vallejo who are growing um, food to get help them get their business off, selling flowers, maybe people sell, growing flowers in the community, but really being a resource for the community to sell their products, to have a commercial kitchen, we know there's a lot of home cooks out there. Uh, maybe, you know, somebody like Chef Chu, um, who now has a huge production facility. But for other people who want to start their own businesses, to have a commercial kitchen that they can sell then to the co-op and maybe some other local businesses. But I see a co-op as being a worker-owned co-op being a partnership in the community, not just um, a grocery store where the money is going to go back to some other state and some other people, where the money actually stays in the community and helps the community thrive for generations, creating jobs for many people in the community and skills, life skills, entrepreneurship skills, learning about grant writing, learning about finances, learning about budgeting, learning about all the things that you need to know when you run a business um, that that could help with. Absolutely. And Aubrey Perry in the chat said, I would love to see that, but how? We know that there has been talk about a worker-owned cooperative um, starting in the community. I definitely can see where that's at. It's something that we've talked to Cookie about. We've actually talked um, to previous city council members about. We know that Oakland helped Mandela Grocery in the beginning. So it's things that we need to see the, the policymakers actually invest in. But Aubrey, definitely get in touch with us because we'd love to have your energy. If you live in Vallejo, we definitely want your energy and to connect you with other people from the community. Awesome. Thank you for that follow-up question, Aubrey. Our next question is for both of us. What's each of your favorite parts of the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest? Um, I think for me, the favorite part, well, in person was always the food. Um, as we stated earlier, the food was always free for everyone to come in. You just had to register, take a quick photo, and you got all this amazing free food. I have never had such good vegan food in Vallejo than the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. Um, in person, it's always a blast. And I really love to see um, the cooking demos. The cooking demos are so much fun because um, I... <laughs> I'm more of an eater, less of a cook. So I love to learn how to cook more because I'm just like, oh, that's what you need to season food with? Let me put that on my grocery shopping list. So I love the cooking demos. I, I mean, I am with you, Erica. The, the in-person events are just the most enriching, heartwarming things um, that really make me feel like this is why I created Food Empowerment Project. Is It's everything together. It's community. It's music, it's dancing, it's culture, it's vegan food. So definitely everything about the in-person ones. But I will admit um, Ballet Folklorico um, is, is it for me. I think that as a, a Mexican, um, I love the idea of seeing a part of my culture um, and my people being celebrated at a vegan event. So, and I'm not a cook, but Erica, I, I, I cheer you on for, for starting to cook more and have these recipes. I love, I just, I love these events. 
I do too. And I have to agree. I was really excited in 2019 when we had the Polynesian dancing. That was really exciting for me. And for me with the online food festival, like I really do love seeing the chefs cooking in their home kitchens. That's a lot of fun. And um, we have so many great things coming to you next week. Uh, we'll be able to learn to cook some cool new dishes next week that I'm really excited about. Um, but I was on set for a lot of the filming for um, most of these things. And so it was really exciting to see the chefs working in person, the ballet Puerto Rico girls dancing. Fun fact, some of them have been dancing as young as five years old or three years old. So they've been dancing their whole lives. They're like in eighth, ninth, and 10th and 11th grades. One I think was graduating from high school. So it was really amazing to see them dancing for like 10 to 15 years and just the passion that their mothers had for their uh, dances as well as the girls. Um, they got to teach me a couple dance steps. So it was really exciting for that too. So yeah, I love the online event just as much. And I'm excited about the cooking demos next week, if you want to tell everybody about that. But I know that watching some of those cooking demos was just like, I want to try this now. Right. It's so hard to wait. Um, if it's all right with you, Lauren, are we, you think we're good to wrap up right about now? Absolutely. Awesome. So I just want to thank you all for your questions and for participating in today's event. Today, we learned more about how to garden in our own town, honored an amazing woman who changed the heart and soul of Vallejo forever, celebrated the start of Latinx Heritage Month, and got the chance to make vegan Filipino spaghetti. I really hope you enjoyed today's program, and we are so excited for you to join us next week. Next week, we'll learn how to make vegan fried chicken from scratch roll and tumble with a jujitsu demonstration demonstration and get a chance to talk about a real dietitian we're going to talk to a real dietitian and get some of your vegan diet questions answered thank you again for joining us if you're interested in viewing this event with spanish captions the video will be available one week after today if you registered keep an eye on your email for when it will be available and we will see you next sunday at 1 p.m pacific standard time have a great day and see you soon